Okay, hello everyone and happy Friday to you and welcome to episode 17 of Beginning with Honeybees. This series is designed for people that are just starting out with bees. Maybe you haven't got your bees yet, maybe you just got them and you're trying to work your way through it. I'm glad you're here. If you're an experienced beekeeper with many years under your belt and you know a thousand beehives, you're welcome also, but you may be bored as always. If you'd like to know what we're going to talk about today, look in the video description down below and line item by line item, I'll list the topics that are covered so that you don't waste your time with us. Uh, the other thing is, if you'd like to post your own questions, I get to as many as I can. Unfortunately, and fortunately, now we're at the point where I get more questions than I have time to answer. Try to keep all of these presentations under an hour. I know even that's a really long time. But I uh, appreciate that you're being here and write your questions down in the comment section below and feel free. By the way, um, some of my frequent viewers like to comment, but they're hesitant to answer questions when someone else posts a comment down uh, in the video. Uh, when you post a comment and you've got an answer for that comment or you can help somebody out, I totally welcome that. I also like all of my viewers to get along with each other and I'm not going to call out any names, but uh, don't. Don't put people down, please. Uh, if somebody has a question or they want to make a comment and maybe it's not the brightest comment, maybe you've been a beekeeper for a long time and you know what you're doing and you just can't wait to let that person know that you know what you're doing and that they don't. That's not what this is for. We're here to uh, lift each other up, inform one another and share about beekeeping and every question is welcome. Okay, so the first thing I want to get into is if you didn't watch last week's, last Friday's uh, Frequently Asked Questions video, we did an install of three packaged bees. We showed two of them online. Uh, I did three though, and they're Saskatras bees, and we purchased them through Man Lake, but they came directly from a breeder in California. So one of the things uh, people want to know is how they do. Well, I wasn't able to get into those beehives right away because guess what happened? As soon as we installed the packages, and this was a week ago last Wednesday, we got bad weather. Really rare for my area. It got really cold, started raining right away. Just, you know, it would have wiped out brand new swarms of bees and things like that because those bees really need to get out of that hive right away and they need to start bringing in resources right away. And to keep it relevant to brand new beekeepers, we loaded up these hives with frames that had no drawn comb on them. So one had one frame of drawn comb. The rest are empty frames, foundationless, and we also had the one piece Pirco acorn frames, and of course the Man Lake new plastic frames as well. And we're seeing how the bees take to those. So I couldn't get in right away. Normally, uh, the question that I get most often is, how soon should I get into my hives once I install that package? Well, there, there are some very critical things that have to happen right away. One is that you feed the bees. The other is, because that needs to be available, and we did that. Thank goodness. We put feeder shims on the top of uh, each of the colonies, and uh, each of them had uh, sugar syrup, one-to-one. -one. We're at the time of year now where we can uh, feed sugar syrup. And they need that to build their comb. And what's interesting about uh, the three colonies that we have, these are the queen cages that came. This is, these are the queen cages I'm used to. Look at the size difference. Uh, these cages normally come with a sugar plug at one end. And you can see the remnants of that there, if you take a look. Anyway, and there's a screen over it. We pull the screen off and we let it go. But the workers chew through that uh, candy plug they get to the queen and they let her out. And normally that queen has a couple of uh, attending workers with her and they feed her and keep her going. The way these came, the Saskatras queens came in cages all by themselves with no workers. They also came with a cork plug in the bottom and uh, no candy. So if you wanted to slow that down, uh, you would have put, and I did demonstrate that in one of them, we put a uh, piece of, uh, marshmallow in there and uh, that's to slow it down but what I did is what's called a direct release. Uh, we did put uh, the marshmallow in one of them just to see how that goes and I direct released two of the other queens and that's because the workers that were in the cages with them and they came in bee buses these new plastic cages and I'll put a link to that video if you haven't seen it I'll put it in the video description so you can go and visit that. 
But uh, what happened was uh, they were trying to feed her. If you notice, they put wax all over these. Of course, these were also in the hive for more than three days. But uh, they put wax all over the queen cage and they were feeding her, so I direct released two out of three of the queens. I could have direct released the third one, but I wanted to show people how to put the marshmallow piece in there. So we did that. They had the marshmallow out of there in less than two days and the queen is out and uh, there's tiny frames of capped brood, which is expected. Why? Because they can't get out. They can't fly. They're holding back. The other thing is, remember, they don't have any place to put their eggs. So if the queen is ready to lay, and they are, all three of the queens are laying, all three of the colonies are bringing in pollen. And, uh, but here's the thing. Each of those queens, each of those colonies is behaving distinctively different from the other. And why is that if you have a pure line of bees like the Saskatras queens? The thing of it is, they actually aren't pure. The Saskatras queens, where they come from in uh, Saskatchewan, Canada, uh, they had pure breeding stock there that they controlled, but the queens that are being reared in the state of California, according to their literature, are being hybridized and open mated, which means that when the queens fly out, virgin queens fly out to mate with drones, uh, when they're doing that, they're not really controlling the stock. So you can get a variant of that genetic line. So there are uh, bees that are surviving there in California that are doing well, are breeding with these queens, but I have three queens and three colonies that are behaving distinctively different from one another. Of course, remember, the bees that come in the package did not come from that queen. So we won't know until over a month from now really what the behavior and performance levels and things like that of those bees is going to be because the stock that's with her may not be pure Saskatchewan stock, but they are showing that they're building comb well, they are bringing in resources. One of them is outperforming all of the others as far as uh, pollen intake. The bees are flying out earlier in the morning. This morning I was up right after sunrise and the Saskatchewan colonies, two out of three, are flying earlier than my weaver bees. And my weaver bees have been early cold weather top performers in the past as well. And as I mentioned, we've had lots of rain, but just the update, we pulled all the cages out we pushed all the frames together and you want to leave your spacers on either ends of the frames, push them all together so that later when you have to inspect, uh, you'll be pulling from the sides and not pulling frames out from the middle and uh, taking the risk of damaging some of your bees, specifically the queen. One of the colonies has a bunch of drones with them already. They shipped with them. Obviously they're not hatched out drones. They came in the package. So it's going to be interesting and we are going to update those. And I'll show you more about something else that comes up and people ask this. In fact, I just got a question today about it. Um, how often, remember that we put the, the bees in a single deep box and this is a new package install. So they have a bottom board, the deep box, and then we have a feeding super, a feeding shim on top of that. And inside each of those is this wrapping around feeder. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit. Um, I have a bunch of these feeders. And the reason is, first of all, when you have a brand new install, whether it's a swarm or a nuke or anything else or in a new location, they could be a little angsty and they don't want to be invaded by you. So you need to go out there prepared with clean rapid round feeders. And then all you're going to be doing is opening the hive, pulling off that lid, which again, the bees are down below and this plugs a hole in that inner cover. Or if you've got a feeder shim like the one I'm going to show you later on today, there is no inner cover, it's integrated to my feeder shim. So we're gonna go over that later. But uh, people have asked, how often should you clean these? And uh, you know, how long are they good for? Well, every time I refill them, I come out with a fresh one that's already clean and I pull off the old one, including the old syrup. I don't just add to the existing syrup because I want it to be fresh. I want those bees to do as, as good as they can. If you're already seeing black mold in your feeder, it's been there too long. You uh, need to keep things clean as much as possible for the bees. The other thing is, and we're talking about the comparison between these three packages, one of them completely empties this thing every three to four days. The other two colonies never dropped the levels more than a half, and they're being fed the same mix, 50-50 sugar water and uh, a teaspoon per quart of Honey Bee Healthy. So that's what's going in there. And... Uh, 
we're just swapping them out even though the syrup is uh, still there. Now the next question that we're gonna talk about too, someone else has been writing me uh, about this type of feeder and that uh, in fact he sent pictures through email. Now you can reach me uh, through of course the comment section of these videos. You can also find me at Fred's Fine Fowl and Honeybees on Facebook. So we have an open forum there too. Great way to contact me if you want to post pictures on that forum or something, you want to share about your bees, please do it at the uh, Facebook page, Fred's Fine Fowl. Anyway, uh, if the liquid goes all the way to the bottom and they empty it, the bees were coming out through the bottom. So even when there's only an eighth of an inch or so in here, especially if your hive is at all tilted, because the way the wrap it around is, if your hive tilts forward, which many do, if it's tilting to the side, bad idea because you're going to get crooked comb that way but it can also tilt back some of the flow heights for example already tilt back and then their landing board tilts down forward so that the rain is shed but uh, if the syrup goes to one end in here and uh, the bees go over this inner cone and they go right underneath this clear cone and out into that syrup and they're drowning so a couple of things can fix that one make sure it's perfectly level Number two, uh, I recommend putting a little weight on the center of this. You could put pennies or something on it just to keep it in place. And then uh, don't let it go completely empty. If it does not go completely empty, the bees don't swim out into that reservoir and drown. So, and then he got back to me after we talked about that and said that there weren't bees dying in the syrup again. And so he's going to continue to keep some syrup level in there. The good news is you can look at these from once you open your hive and you look, you can see the liquid level without opening it and know whether or not uh, they're already at the bottom. Now that's part of the hive that you can visit as often as you want. You're not disrupting the bees. You're pulling the outer cover off. You're seeing this inside your shim or if you've got an empty box and then this is sitting on an inner cover, that type of thing, you'll be able to see without exposing the bees and interacting with the bees exactly what the levels are and how they're doing. So keep them full. Now how often should you clean them? Let's say it's full. Should you pull off a full one and throw it away? No, they're good for about five days. So if you've got uh, sugar syrup in there, four or five days to me is about the limit. And then you want to pull that out, get rid of it and refresh it completely with a brand new clean rapid round feeder and fresh uh, sugar syrup. So that's it with the rapid round. And that's the update. They all made it. All the queens are laying. Uh, and I did not pull apart everything to a full inspection. I just pulled those frames apart enough until I could see that there is brood and that the queens are laying. Uh, you don't see, you're not going to see capped brood. You're only going to see young larvae and you might still see eggs, but looking for eggs is a detailed inspection. If you see evidence of larvae, that's enough. Close it up and get out of there. Don't spend a lot of time exposing those bees and trying to check them out because they're already struggling. So there's that. My first question here today is from Merrick and he says, when a hive dies off, what do you do with the leftover resources? And that's a really good question because we just came out of winter. And for me personally, and this is, you know, everybody's got their own idea. Uh, what I do, cause I have this year, even though we had a devastating winter, super cold, high winds, everything else, the bees made it through with very little consumption of their resources. So I actually have entire medium supers full of honey edge to edge the frames are full you need to pull that off because the bees are bringing in new nectar we're in a nectar flow they're going to ignore the old stored honey and they're not going to use it they're going to bring in new nectar fill the frames and then whenever they need it like now when we get these rainy days and storms uh, they'll draw off their newest uh, sugar syrup and nectar and they'll get their own honey stores that they've just put in leaving the old honey stores alone so you can pull that off. You can uncap and extract last winter's honey. And uh, I recommend that you not reinstall those. For example, I just got these uh, packages. I could easily take full medium supers of honey and stick them right on there. I don't want to do that. Some people say, well, they're frozen and they're good to go. Well, freezing really only takes care of small hive beetles, any leftover varroa. Varroa are going to die anyway. In the absence of a bee host, the varroa die. So we're really talking about small hive beetles when you're freezing it. Uh, and maybe there's eggs from, uh, you know, the, the wax moths and things like that. But again, that's highly unlikely. 
But if you freeze it, that's what gets killed. But if you've got um, other issues, if you've got other problems with that hive that you took off, especially if this is a die off, you don't know what happened. So freezing is not enough because there are other pathogens, there's other bacteria that survives freezing. The only thing that's really gonna kill that off and it's, it's more work than it's worth, more risk than it's worth, is gonna be irradiation. So I don't know anybody that's got a microwave that big, for example. But uh, you know, you're talking about Nozema and other things. Nozema can sit in a dormant hive for 40 years. So I would avoid the complexity of trying to treat and make it safe for the bees if you're gonna put it on a new colony. I would not reuse old comb that's still full of resources. Take those resources out, including pollen and things like that, because the bees are gonna do the same thing. They're gonna bring in new pollen they're not gonna to touch the old pollen and they're gonna use immediately what they've just brought in. And that's why when you pull apart a really old colony, you'll see stores of pollen and honey way up in the corners that have been untouched in some cases for years if it's one of those colonies that you find that's been abandoned. There, there are YouTube videos about those and look at the resources that are in there. They just don't use them all. And that's why we have honeybees to begin with. They produce a lot more and store a lot more than they will ever use when they're left alone. And that's why we're able to draw off the resources and not impact the overall health and survivability of those honeybees. So my recommendation, when a hive dies off, what do you do with the leftover resources? Take the honey for yourself. You have zero risk taking honey from a hive that has died out because none of the pathogens, none of the health issues that bees experience are passed on to humans. So I recommend harvest the honey, scrape down all the frames, and uh, then once they're clean and empty, and you can have the wax, use the wax to prime those frames, then restore those once you've processed them. So there's that one. The next one is from uh, Rick Lott. How far apart should I set up hives, and should I be concerned about them migrating to another hive? That's a, a common question. You see people put up beehives that look identical, the whole the relief on the front of every beehive looks the same as the one next to them the most common commercial hive is painted white they're stacked on uh, pallets you know and and often there's only a couple inches of space and then you'll see these huge bee yards with hundreds of hives even thousands of hives row after row after row with very little variation so what happens is something that we refer to as bee drift so, and often, so it'll be one extremity or the other. So the center colonies in these long rows that look very similar, uh, at either end, those colonies will end up picking up more workers and more foragers overall. And that's because those foragers are coming in. And uh, I love showing this in slow motion sequences, slow motion video. There are forages, foragers that fly in and they're loaded with up to their own body weight in pollen and nectar, and they're exhausted by the time they get back to your apiary. And they try to make it to the landing board. So let's say their landing board is two hives over. They just get exhausted and land on the closest landing board. Because they have resources, because they have pollen and nectar, they'll be welcomed into that colony. So they actually can become part of that colony and that's referred to as drift. So what did you lose? You own all these bees. These are all of your colonies, you're managing them. So what do you lose personally if your center hive has foragers that end up two hives down or one hive down? You don't lose anything. They're still strengthening those colonies. And uh, unless that center colony is highly weakened from that, which I, which I doubt, it usually doesn't happen in large enough numbers to impact and reduce the number of foragers significantly in the hive that's uh, suffering from drift, losing workers to drift. So I don't think it's a huge issue, but if you really want them to come to just that colony that they flew out from, uh, there are people that say, you know, separate them by 30 feet. I don't think that's necessary. I have hives that are tucked in trees and bushes and by spruce trees. And those hives, by the way, they're set up by themselves, tend to do extremely well. So, but they're only separated from other hives by 20 feet, 30 feet. And uh, even my hives that are in a row are spaced out a couple feet from one another. Maybe the, the two that are on the same rack would be, you know, 14 inches apart. And uh, even while we were installing one of the package bees on a rack right next to an established hive, 
uh, a little bee showed up on that landing board with pollen and resources. So that was a drifter right off the bat in the video, and but they rejected it and it had to fly off again. Sometimes you'll see bees fly in loaded and they'll make an attempt to land on the landing board and then they'll just fall on the ground. But then they'll recover a little bit, get their bearings, and then they'll go up and make several attempts at uh, landing on landing boards. So if you look at some of my modifications for my own beehives, some of them have wind flares on the sides. So that means once the bee gets in there, there's a crosswind, the wind cuts out and he lands on that board. Because in a high wind situation, they come in and the wind blows them away and they circle back and they blows them away and they circle back. If they don't have a large landing board to go onto, and if they don't have something to buffer or intercept that wind, then uh, it's a huge effort for them to get back to that hive. So we have a huge advantage as backyard beekeepers with only a handful of beehives. You can do all the fancy modifications you want to make it more distinctive. So the geometry of your hive, the different types of roofs, the different colors, the strong dramatic contrasts of your hives being a little bit distinctive and a little different with each subsequent colony makes finding those hives from a distance easier for the bees. Because what the bees do is they get up close, they know where the apiary is, they get in that vicinity, and then they home in on that specific hive and some are better than others at it. So if they drift, you lose nothing. But you can separate your hives to help the bees find their parent colony. And of course, the physical features of the hive can make it more distinctive. Some have flat roofs, some might have gabled roofs, some might be white, some might be blue. Uh, there's this saying that bees can't see red. They don't see it as red, but they see a color distinction. And uh, you can just make strong, bold, geometric designs on the fronts of your colonies and uh, help the bees orient themselves to the one that they left. So, but you're not losing your bees anyway. As I said, they're just going to another hive, but separating them does help with that. Next question is from uh, Six Deep Six. Here are cell feeders. How to use them? Should there be a spacer or inner cover? And what about cleaning? The cleaning issues are identical to these rapid rounds. The thing is, this is a Cerasel feeder right there. Uh, they come with their own wooden shimmer around them and then the plastic basin can be pulled out and cleaned and replenished. So here's the thing, those are expensive, but it's my same philosophy. Uh, when you open the cover and you have your Cerasel feeder in there, have a new one ready to go in, pull the other one out, leave the wooden frame because it's just set in there. And then that whole thing, the shim and the basin and everything should be sitting on an inner cover. And that's because there's a lot of space under the basin that the bees can put a lot of comb into. And it is designed to sit on an inner cover and leave bee space for the bees to move around freely underneath of it, but we want to limit that space because where there is more than bee space, the bees are going to put burr comb and they're going to put propolis in there. So we want to limit that. And you want to be able to pull that plastic basin out. If it's all glued up with uh, propolis and wax, then you're going to have a, a tougher time prying that out. It's also why you want to do that on a hot day, in the middle of the day, fewer bees and uh, the warmer temperatures will help uh, pull those things apart easier. But And the more frequently you swap out that feeder when you're feeding. That's the other thing. We're talking about something that only happens during a dearth, during early spring, before uh, you're putting your honey supers on that you're going to harvest from. And then at the end of the year, when we're going into the fall and resources again are slight, but you're through harvesting. Mm -hmm. We don't feed and we don't put sugar syrup on when you have honey supers on that you are going to harvest from and use. So that whole shim, that whole feeder will go away during the nectar flow. So just like here, we're going into a nectar flow pretty soon. My shims and my feeder shims are going to be switched over and modified as upper hive entrances and they won't have feeders in them at all. You don't want to be feeding what you're going to be harvesting. So there's a bit the same philosophy. It's going to be expensive if you have those. Uh, they make them in eight frame and 10 frame, by the way. We'll list all the items we're talking about today down in the uh, video description with links so you can see what they cost and where you can get them for yourself. But it's the same rules. And uh, but the Cerasel does not have the problem where once it empties uh, that the bees crawl out underneath and drown because they can get feed all the way 
down in the corners. So if there's a low corner somewhere, the bees still access that from underneath and they still feed from it. So much less risk of drowning in that one. Number five, how hot is it on the aluminum entrance strip of that flow hive too? I'm guessing hot enough to burn one's finger, exclamation point. Okay, the thing about the flow hive two, uh, they have this integrated, these are flow hive twos up here. They have a, a piece of aluminum on the bottom. Uh, I think this individual was concerned that that aluminum gets so hot in the morning sun because you know they face south that it would burn your finger. Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, the aluminum is so reflective and it is vented underneath and above. So in the flow hive too, the landing board itself, the cedar, is much hotter than the adjacent aluminum piece. Aluminum is reflective. It does not. It does conduct heat and conduct cold because it is metal but uh, never hot enough to burn your finger. And in sunlight, it is not as hot as the adjacent wooden wear. So I can see where somebody might think that, but nope, it's actually very cool and cooler than the surrounding woodwork. So number six from Champy, the upper feeder blocks the vent hole. Is it necessary to create other holes for proper ventilation? That's a really good question. And this is about my feeder shim that I made. It's my own design. And guess what I did this morning just for you? I made another one. So this is my feeder shim. Do, 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 do. And as you've seen before, I did a video dedicated just showing you how to make this. What is the advantage of the feeder shim to begin with? First of all, sometimes people just take a medium super, a medium box, and they put that on, and then their feeder sits in there. And then that's good. But to do that, you have to take an inner cover from a hive, and you have to put that inner cover on the brood box, for example, first. Then you put the frame on top of that. Then you take your wrap it around, for example, and you put it on that, and then this is the box, and then you put a cover on that, and you're enclosed, and you're good to go. The purpose of my design is to integrate the bottom cover. So we have it all as one piece. So what do we do? We eliminated, normally you'd have two joints here because you're going to have an inner cover underneath of it. So you have a joint, inner cover, another joint, then the box. This eliminates that joint and makes a convenient one box solution. So then the question was, if you notice, I already put vents in here, which I'm going to talk about. But once you put this in, the rapid round feeder, and I have these on all of my new colonies because we're feeding them, uh, the bees can't get up into this space because remember, there's this inner cover. The bees come in here, they feed in here, and they go right back through that central riser. And they do not get out in here and they do not drown. And they also can't get out and access this overall space. So what if we want to ventilate the hive? If this is set up this way, this hole right here is blocked and there is fluid. So there's no airflow through this box at all. So that was a great idea and a great question. So what can you do? Well, today I went out and I inserted screens, stainless steel screens. So what I did was I drilled a two inch hole here just about uh, three eighths of an inch thick. And then I came and I took an inch and a half hole and I drilled that all the way through. And that first hole allowed me to create a seating area for the stainless steel screen. I inserted that, I made two of them. And this will be ventilation through the box, out the front. So if we wanna set this up to be a ventilator, what am I gonna do here? That's the ventilation setting right there. And that is a inch and a half diameter hole that's drilled through. So now we have venting through the bottom when the feeder's in place and it vents right through here, but it still allows no access for the bees, but it allows the bees in that box below to have ventilation through summer or winter. This is a great winter shim. And uh, I know fancy joints here and everything, but I just made this this morning, in fact, that's probably why this video is going out late because I spent so much time doing it. This shows the whole thing. 
And by the way, you want those vent holes to be in the back and your vent out the front because we want the air to circulate through. And that seems to be the best configuration. The other thing is I um, finished all the corners and joints with 100% silicon sealer. And there's also wood glue. And for wood glue, we use tight bond two for this one because the center bottom piece, even though it looks seamless here, this is glued together two pieces of wood. And then I drilled the hole a little off center there. And that's it, feeder shim, and that's how to vent it. So I'm gonna put that stainless steel screen. This is what I cut out. This stuff is really good. It's really rigid. This is what I used to create the vent. So I'm gonna put that down in the video description. And we'd go from there. But thank you, Champy, for that question. That's why I spent two hours building that shim. Of course, it's not gonna to go to waste. I'm gonna use it in my in my apiary, but I wanted to show how the vents work. So two inch holes to create that little shoulder that you can cut your circles and recess these into, and then an inch and a half hole inside that that goes all the way through and creates the vent. And if the bees don't like that in wintertime, they'll just cover it up with propolis and stuff, which later, uh, the next spring, for example, when you get back into the heat zone, how do you get rid of that propolis and wax that they've used to close this up? You just take a hair dryer or one of those electric heat guns and you melt it right out of there and you're good to go. And St. Germain, I installed two packages a month ago, same local supplier. One is more docile than the other. One stings and the other doesn't. Why? Okay, I'm not sure uh, which the bees are, but I have the same situation. I bought Saskatraps bees from one supplier and uh, ordered them at the same time. Three packages came. Each one of those packages has a different disposition. Two of them are completely docile, easy going and laid back. The third one is a little spicy, not super defensive. Like right now I can go out there, drink coffee, sit by them and watch them, see how they go. Uh, but the one package in particular, that one colony, will I'll pick up a guard bee after, you know, 20 minutes or so, if I'm too close. Keep in mind, I'm making videos. I made these slow motion videos recently uh, within the last couple of days. And uh, the one colony sent out some guards that didn't sting, but they definitely didn't want me sitting right in front of the landing board with my camera. But of course, that's my fault. You don't belong right in front of the landing board. That's the business end of the hive. But I guess to answer this question, St. Germain, by the way, one of my frequent commenters, deep six, six deep six, the same. Um, there, there will be different dispositions within each colony because there are genetic variables. It's kind of like you ever look at a family that has a bunch of kids and half the kids are awesome and there's the one little jerk that's throwing a cat off the porch and stuff. Uh, they the same genetics. <laughs> you have different, that's probably a terrible analogy, but that's kind of how I feel about it. Bees, there are genetic traits that are carried on through these bees and some are favorable, some are not. And uh, they're just, you just need to treat them each differently. You know, when you go up to a certain hive, this hive is going to be completely laid back. Everything's going to be great. They're going to be easy to work with. You can observe them from 10 inches away and uh, they're fantastic. Other colonies, you know, yeah, not going over there. Just look at all the guards. You know, they're all up, their mandibles are open, their antennae are forward. Uh, all the guard bees are just ready to go. We don't know what's going on in there. Uh, they might get low on resources. They might have been recently attacked by wasps, but uh, you're just gonna have to treat them different. They're just, uh, you know, I was really surprised with the range of behavior in the Saskatrass bees. My weaver bee lines are all the same. So those colonies, and I'll give you a link. Uh, I, can, I can give you a link to the Saskatraps breeder so you can read about their stuff. And I'll give you a link to the Weaver family so you can read about their bees. But um, the, the behavior for one, the Weavers have worked out their genetics. They're consistent and they're performing consistently. We're still waiting, the jury's out on the Saskatraps bees, how well they're gonna perform. So we're gonna to wait to see how that's going. And those behaviors again are the workers that came in the package. That's not the genetic stuff from the queen. So I don't even know what they are yet. So St. Germain, depending on, you just install these packages. So if you've got hostile bees in those packages, that's gonna change. Remember your queen's gonna lay eggs and those pupa are gonna develop and hatch. And you're gonna have a whole new population in there that comes from the queen. So really 
you don't know how I mean, that colony is going to be yet. That's just the package. They didn't come from the queen. So that's the other end of it. We're not going to know until a month out uh, what the bees are going to be like from the queens that we installed with those packages. So that's a wait and see thing, and you can keep us posted on that. Another person wrote me, um, what is the cheapest finish for my beehive? Where's the best place to buy paint? Okay, hmm. Well, here's the thing. Um, I mean, I know things are expensive. If you get into beekeeping, you buy everything brand new, I know it's a lot of money. And uh, I put expensive finishes on my beehives, which aren't necessarily the best finishes. You know, I use the Minwax, Helmsman, uh, you know, spar varnish on the outside of my hives. And I have to do several coats of that. I know that runs into a lot of money, but here's the funny thing. I have a friend that works at Home Depot and she works at the uh, paint center. So, and I was talking to my wife about this. If you just want to get paint on your hives and preserve them, and you're not concerned about, you know, the color that you're using, there are some fussy people that buy paint at Home Depot. I'm sure it's the same at other paint centers. You can probably go to Menards or whatever building center you have that custom mixes paint. These people will buy a $100 gallon of paint, custom tinted, go home, not like it, bring it back, reject that gallon of paint, and make them mix another one. And you know what happens to that gallon of paint? It goes on a shelf right under the mixing counter. So I suggest you go in and talk to the person at the paint counter at your local building center and say, hey, did anybody turn in some paint they hated? And was it, you know, super expensive exterior, medium gloss house paint? And uh, if they have that, you're going to get that for anywhere from 5 to $10 on a $100 gallon of paint. And because they just need to get rid of it. They use it for demos and stuff. I don't even know what they do to dispose of it. I think you're doing them a favor by taking it on because Home Depot doesn't need it. But go and get paint that's returned by people that they hate. And uh, that was a really good, I'm glad you asked that question because it led me to a whole nother area here. But uh, that's the cheapest. So I don't recommend buying a cheap quality paint because your labor is worth something, your time and effort. It takes me a long time to put three and four finishes on a brood box, medium super, you know, slatted rack, something like that, or landing boards. Again, that, that'll lead me to another question really quick though, is um, people really get hung up on what is the composition of that paint? What is the composition of that finish that you're going to put on your bee box? Is that safe for bees? Is that, you know, is that bee friendly? Here's, here's something that, you know, and again, every bee, bee, beekeeper is going to do their own thing. And if you're holistic and you want to only put paraffin wax or something on your hives, or if you want to recycle materials that come from the hive. There are people that use propolis and make their own finishes and shellacs and things like that. That's fine. But the area that we do not put paint on, that we do not put varnish on, that we do not put shellac on, and whatever you're gonna put on your beehive, it doesn't go on the interior surfaces. It doesn't go on the interior of the landing board. It only goes on the exterior. These are the portions that are exposed to weather. So I'm just gonna, flat say that what you're putting on the outside, if it's safe for people, if it is a paint finish that is suitable for people to paint their, you know, their picnic tables and their countertops and things like that, and it is safe for humans to have contact with and it's house paint, you know, we don't have lead in house paint anymore. We don't have uh, the toxins. It used to be that there were toxins in the paint mixes that no longer exist. So if you're talking about an acrylic latex paint, you're talking about something that once it's dry, that once it's finished, it's basically inert for all practical purposes. So your bees don't climb out on the outside of your beehive and chew the paint. They're not ingesting it. They're not getting exposure to some toxin that's gonna harm the bees. So, I mean, I'm not faulting people that wanna go the extra yard and wanna make sure that everything is as if, what if my bees ate it, would this not kill them? Well, they're not gonna eat it because it's on the outside of the hive. But uh, if you wanna go that route and just make sure that if they did, if you had the one bee that went out there and was naughty and chewed paint and ate paint chips, uh, then you're still safe when it comes with to acrylic polymers and things like that. 
So my suggestion is get paint that's weather durable, get a finish that's weather durable. The more pigment that's in it, the more uh, durable it's gonna be when exposed to ultraviolet rays of the sun and everything. So get a good quality paint. Uh, your time is, is gonna be worth something. You want those boxes. I've got boxes that I painted in 2008 that uh, they're a little rough looking, but the paint is still good. And that's because I bought a really good exterior quality. It was a cerulean blue house paint. And uh, that holds up a very long time. So please don't get super caught up. You're a brand new beekeeper. And that's a question probably that comes up a lot. You know, what should I be using in the outside of my boxes? Your bees are not in direct constant contact with the exterior of your hive. So I would go and find out, I use consumer reports when I look, you know, I use Valspar paint and uh, Hunter Green is, is what I'm using this year. But uh, I put that on the rooftops of my flow hives. I put that on the exterior boxes. Uh, even my supports and stands and things like that are being painted with Valspar. So find a good quality paint that's at a reasonable price, but it's gonna pay off in the long run if you get a very cheap paint that requires repainting every year and uh, some of the really good paints have primer and final coat built into that blend and if that's a little bit more expensive you saved buying the primer so please don't get super caught up in you know what the composition of that paint is and is that going to be healthy for my bees bees are on the exterior surface of houses and porches and rails and they're at swimming pools and they're on uh, cow slurries and cow manure spreaders and bees are on everything everywhere but where they're living inside the colony put no finish on there they're going to put their own finish on it it's called propolis the really old hive bodies and stuff are covered edge to edge with propolis so you're not painting the interior therefore get a very good quality exterior finish and you're going to be good to go. So those are all my questions. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. I hope I have uh, better weather coming. It's supposed to rain again today. Big surprise. And uh, we'll give an update at the beginning of each FAQ on those Saskatchewan bees. I'll let you know what they're doing. And ultimately when we can get into them, we're going to do a hive inspection. We'll go frame by frame, see how they're doing. Put your questions down below. Thank you for being here. And uh, that's it. Have a great weekend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.